The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the yellow shirt elves have the catapult cranked and the sled in position, while the red shirt snow giants are arming it up with presents and cheer. Then Santa salutes, the reindeer light up their burners, and down the flight deck he goes, ho, ho, ho. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We have an interview with Reiki Spohr this time, talking about his very interesting and fun new novel, Princess Holiara. This is Wright's kind of meta-take on the anime magic girl genre. It's full of magical powers, fighting serious evil, and uh, a guy in his 30 who has to transform into a girl in her teens and go back to middle school while trying to fight monsters from another dimension. It's a weird, exciting book, and we'll get into the details of how Wright came up with such a thing and talk to him soon. We'll also continue to liven things up for the holiday with a few more ditties for transition music. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of the Aiden Universe novel Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Now here's the news. We have new free fiction and nonfiction on the Bain.com website this month. Check these out. For fiction, Sharon Lee and Steve Miller deliver a story set in their Liaden universe, and one that's directly related to the new Liaden universe novel that will be out in the new year, coming up, Neogenesis. The title of that story is Block Party. Also out is an in-depth look at the other nuclear energy source for space travel, you know, the one that actually works right now, Nuclear Fission. How would it work, what are its best uses, and what would it mean for interstellar travel and interplanetary travel? It's a great look at what we can and can't do right now with nuclear energy in space. And it's called, wait for it, Nuclear Fission Power in Space. Andy Presby is the author. Andy is an officer in the U.S. Navy and a man who has been on a submarine or two, so he knows what he's talking about. Block Party by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller and Nuclear Fission Power in Space by Andy Presby are both available right now on the main page at Bain.com. After January 15th, you'll be able to find them in two free ebook collections at Bain eBooks, Free Stories 2017 and Free Nonfiction 2017. Those are available for download in all formats in the whole universe, pretty much, at Bain eBooks. So check them out. Welcome, Reich E. Spore, to the podcast. Hello, Reich. Hey, how you doing, Tony? Reich E. Spore is the author of Bane books, including uh, Digital Night, Paradigms Lost, the Arenaverse novels, Grand Central Arena, Spheres of Influence, and Challenges of the Deeps. He's also the... Did, did I leave out an Arenaverse novel there, Reich, or is that... There's three, right? There's three of them. Great. Okay. He's also the author of the epic fantasy only- and adventure uh, series... Um, the balanced, the balanced sword uh, series, including uh, entries Phoenix Rising, Phoenix in Shadow, and Phoenix Ascendant. With Eric Flint, he's the co-author of hard science fiction boundary series novels, including Boundary Threshold, Portal, Castaway Planet, which is kind of a secondary series. The that's a really cool concept, and Castaway Odyssey. Now out at booksellers everywhere is a new novel by Wright Princess Holy Aura. Uh, right, do you want to mention anything else, um, that uh, the polychrome stuff? Well, yes. Um, I'm also the author of a Oz-based novel, Polychrome, which uh, was uh, self-published after a successful Kickstarter. So, you like Oz? Go, t- go take a look at it. It can be found on Amazon? Yeah, Amazon, all, all the fine online stores. Anywhere at your website as well. Um, well, right. So tell us about Princess Holiar a little. This is just, 
really, really different. Um, we were just talking. There was some. Uh, there was a Bane. What the hell thread somewhere that you you found? What <laughs> what what was that about? And what the heck is this book? Well, the thread was on on a forum called SpaceBattles.com, which uh, had expanded way past what its title implies, and it's more like a general discussion board for all the science fiction, fantasy, gaming sort of stuff. And basically, somebody had run across the description of the book. And everything was basically saying, what the hell? <laughs> I don't know what this is. Um, as to what it is, um, it is my attempt to um, examine the usually seen in Japan genre called maho shoujo, uh, magical girl, and genre in a, in a novel format, and examine the assumptions of that genre while both taking it seriously and sometimes breaking it on occasion. That's a short description. Uh, I believe we'll be getting into longer description in a minute. Yeah. So, well, explain explain the what a magic girl is and and what is that genre that you're that before we start to talk about how you play with it. What what is the genre itself? Because I'm not a huge, I'm not greatly familiar with with anime. Uh, and probably a lot of listeners won't be, although I imagine a lot more than normal will be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Magical Girl genre is a manga and anime genre, which goes all the way back, really, to 1953 with a manga called Princess Knight. And uh, a few years later, Himitsu no Akko-chan in Ribbon, um, which was the earliest Magical Girl. The... Um, the genre continued on, off and on through the years, but um, Princess Holy Order focuses on the subdivision of it called uh, Magical Girl Warrior, Maho Shoujo um, Senshi. And uh, those are, again, there's lots and lots of examples. The one that is best known here in uh, the United States is Sailor Moon. Um, and the basic outline of it, well, the, the name of it is pretty self-descriptive. It's about um, young girls, usually between about the age of uh, 12 to 14, but some of them are younger and some of them are older, who are selected to have some magical power to perform some sort of special um, task. Um, the non-warrior ones, it may be social, solving social problems or so on, but the warriors, it's usually they're chosen to deal with some magical threat that ordinary people in the world well can't. Um, there's really any real explanations for why these girls are chosen, except that, well, they're the ones chosen. But uh, it is a staple of the genre that they are um, chosen, and they usually have to get um, other girls of their rough age group as both allies and sometimes as uh, adversaries. And they are frequently um, recruited initially by a uh, wiser magic-wielding being um, often in the shape of something cute and harmless looking that's actually hiding a tremendous amount of magical power. Uh -huh. um, the combination allows, is, you know, some people have described them as, it is best to understand them as 25 minute advertisements for toy merchandise. Um, because they generally are, of course, associated with all the possible cute stuff that you could market for it, ranging from uh, the uh, wands or other weapons, devices that the magical girl may wield in the course of her duties to uh, models of the girls, to their cute little mascot or whatever. Um, Sailor Moon is a billion-dollar merchandising juggernaut. So in some cases, it makes just incredible amounts of money. Yeah. Well, what is um, – are you aware of anything in, in Japanese mythology that – that um, that led to uh, this, this sort of anime uh, genre, or is it just sort of uh, sui generis? Or well, yes and no. It's the general young young boys or young person's journey is a classic uh, in Japanese mythology. Somebody who's in the uh, the teen years is you know standing in between being an adult and being a child, and often. They have tales of such people going on journeys to, you know, accomplish some great goal, whether it might be, you know, revenge or, 
or exploration or carrying out a prophecy or what have you. The closer inspiration for the magical girl warrior types um, comes from the same as the uh, show, man, as what are called the shonen um, anime, which focus on magical, uh, on superpowered boy warriors, uh, which is the Sentai genre, where you have a, uh, the, these are best, the Sentai genre is best known in America under um, Power Rangers, mm-hmm. um, but that goes back quite a ways. The, the, the Sentai genre has been around a long time. Uh, but a lot of those themes are similar. You have a group of people gathered together to fight some terrible force, and they're usually both color-themed and power-themed with um, their basic temperaments carefully chosen to complement each other and to provide character conflict within the group. So they're usually also symbolizing, in if they're the pure coil type, they're usually also symbolizing both um, elemental powers and virtues, um, often the Confucian virtues um, or the samurai virtues of uh, Japan. Hmm. Um, the different virtues uh, ranging from justice to something that's often called just simply humanity, which is a harder one to translate, but it basically is, is uh, sort of the core heroic virtue. You really like this stuff. You've been reading it for years, right? It's it's. Well, I'm. I haven't been a tremendous magical girl fan originally, but it was. It's an interesting genre. So there's a number of them that I've watched or read parts of. Um, they've you know, they the Japanese do deconstruct their own stuff. Uh, the most obvious deconstruction in. in uh, uh, in, that we know of over here and that's very popular in Japan is this Puella Madoka Magica, which basically starts out looking like a t- typical magical girl show and within two episodes starts to torpedo every possible assumption you have about it, yeah. including trying to crush your heart every single episode. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a, a general anime fan. Um, the thing about the magical girl that interested me was that in some ways it is such a stylized genre that even the parodies seem to be sort of stylized. And I wondered if somebody writing in American mode might have anything interesting to say about it. I admit, I didn't expect you guys to pick this one. I sent you guys three full proposals and two ideas that I could flesh into proposals, and I was sure you'd pick one of the other others that I sent you, not this one. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was just so. I mean, you seem to have a passion for it, and, and it came across in your, uh, in your, uh, in your pitch for it that that Tony and I both both felt. Um, and I think you turned out a hell of a book, <laughs> truthfully. Thank you. It's really um, unusual and cool. Terrified every every moment that I was writing it, I was terrified because of all the minefields I was tap dancing through. But yes, I think it turned out pretty well. Well, we should talk about some of those. <laughs> Mine fills in a moment. Um, so you got the magic girl. Um, in our case, it's Princess Holiara, um, who's going to show up. And, and you have the apocalypse maidens that join her. Um, I guess... Princess Holiara is just the first of the apocalypse. The first of the apocalypse maidens. Um, and, um, and and opposing this force is some, some force of evil, right, That's that's coming into the world that wants to... Well, the, the high boss of the whole group is Azathoth Nine Armed. And obviously, with that name, derived partly from the uh, Lovecraftian um, mythology. Yeah. Um, but with a typical magical girl twist that they are, that the really high commanders are all female, including Azathoth. And um, they are also directly influenced in their manifestation when they come to the world by the, I guess, gestalt, what we would call the memes, but really the, the uh, overall way in which things are perceived by the current civilization. So in, in ancient Greece, they would have been, you know, hostile titans and monsters from uh, Echidna's brood and so on. While here, uh, they will take on some, some of them will have the Lovecraftian ones because Lovecraft is still a powerful um, meme influence here. But some of them will also have more uh, modern 
and sometimes almost, but not really, amusing uh, connections to things that we've invented in more recent years. Uh, so it's just like dark power that takes on a on whatever the current culture's uh, uh, boogeyman's might be, or boogie. Woman. That's a good way to put it. Boogie things. Yeah. <laughs> They're uh, they they have a true essence to them. I mean, they are a real force with real identities. But the way in which many of the creatures manifest does depend on the gestalt, um, uh, the the collective conscious of the um, world at the time that they enter, and of course the location they enter, because the gestalt that you're going to get if your uh, evil forces decide that the center of their manifestation is in India is more likely going to be from Bollywood horror movies uh, than it is if you emerge over here, where it's going to be more likely things from our horror movies or books or whatever. So what are the, just in terms of uh, the sheer anime-ness of the book, um, what are Princess Holiara and the Apocalypse Maiden's powers? Um, in general, their major powers are um, are elemental. But they're elemental both in straight physical means, that is, um, Princess Radiance Blaze is somebody who controls fire. But it's also, um, in a, it is representative or symbolic. So fire is also intelligence and speed and so on. And water is healing and protection. So Princess um, Tsunami Reflection, who has the power of water, is the one that can heal people better than the others. All of them have some level of healing that is beyond human, but she's the one who's best capable of healing other people, and so on. So all of them have both a direct um, element that they represent, and they represent it in both the direct physical um, interpretation and in more symbolic ways. Okay. And now for the weirdness. <laughs> As the book opens, uh, there's this dude named Stephen Russ who's walking around, and he comes he goes, comes near a dark alley somewhere. Um, he's a geek. He's a gamer. He's basically he's a really nice guy. He's mentoring some other some some younger guy, kids. Um, tell us about Stephen. Well, Stephen is one of the guys that many many of us probably know. A Steve. He's that kind of guy who he's living a sort of lower. Uh, like he doesn't make lots of money. He doesn't live in in uh, even a middle class thing. He lives in a kind of cheesy apartment, um, living day to day. But at the same time, it doesn't really seem to bother him because hey, he's living. He's better off than other people he knows. Um, but he's never had the focus, ambition, or perhaps just never had the opportunities to go further than that. He's intelligent. He's skilled. You know. He, this particular character is directly based off of a man that I knew when I was younger. Uh, his his name was um, Steve Reed, and uh, he unfortunately died a very untimely death. He was very young. Uh -huh. um, but he was a mentor to me when I was young, and I wanted to salute him in some way. And for various reasons, I think that this was something he would have found very appropriate. Anyway. Steve is basically one of these nice guys that helps people sometimes more than he helps himself. And partly because of that, he's never really gone anywhere with his life, and he hasn't really seen anything that drove him to go beyond it. It's not that he doesn't have the capacity. It's just that he looked at the world and said, really, what am I driving myself for? I can just live this way. Maybe he feels somewhere inside that he's a failure or that he didn't do as much as he should. But he never lets other people see that, and he even rarely will show people that there's anything bothering him, because he doesn't want to put a burden on other people. This is this is basically what Stephen Russ is like. Mm -hmm. So he comes upon something, uh, somebody getting hurt, right? Can you set the, the okay, opening yep. scene up for us? A young boy, yeah, he walks, he hears screams from the alleyway and, of course, runs down it. And there he sees uh, Emmanuel, who's a boy who lives in his neighborhood, and a little white rat sitting on Emmanuel's shoulder, all of them surrounded by a bunch of feral cats that are clearly attacking him. Um, so Steve naturally intervenes. 
he's not going to let a bunch of cats uh, hurt or maybe even kill uh, these, you know, his his neighbor and this little animal. And as soon as he uh, intervenes and makes it clear he's not going away, the thing, the cats suddenly aren't cats anymore. They're much bigger, and they are very alien-looking with no eyes, blunt heads, and bat wings. Um, those who are very familiar with the Lovecraftian mythos might recognize the description of night gaunts. They are uh, nasty creatures, and Steve is in grave danger but manages to beat them. And he doesn't... Uh, At which point... Yeah. He doesn't back away. He's he's courageous. He, he, Despite the fact that suddenly the world went insane on him, he just looked over and he said, he's still looking at a little boy who's going to get killed, and now, even more certainly, it's not just going to be scratched up, it's going to be killed. These things are monsters. Mm -hmm. So he risks himself to save Emmanuel and the little rat that's on his shoulder, which he assumes is a pet at the time. And then, having barely survived this battle, but finally defeating them all, the white rat speaks to him and thanks him for intervening. The rat talks. Life is about to get very strange. Yeah. The rat does talk. Um, and... I always envision I always envision Silvertail speaking like this, <laughs> as he introduces himself as Silvertail Hotseeker, <laughs> a very precise speaker. That is the name of the uh, of the rat, and he's he's um, he is like you say he's he's he's, he's just he... shrunk out. <laughs> What's that? He's your classic old wise wizard, just shrunk down. Yeah, he is. Um, he's he's the old wise uh, advisor and wizard who is going to uh, to, to guide Stephen, and it's going to be a rather odd request. He or uh, or possibility lays before Stephen. Um, why? Why? By all right. So you chose Silvertail. Um, any particular reason? Uh, these sorts of stories have often have a. a powerful um, sort of totem creature, right? Yes. They, they often have, well, they, in a more cynical way, they're a mascot that you can market well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, they often have a creature. In Sailor Moon, it was the cat, Luna. So partly I chose to make Silvertail a rat simply because it was a good op opposite to the cat of Sailor Moon, which would be by far the most familiar to most people. So cat versus rat. Also, I had white rats as pets when I was a kid, so I thought it was amusing because I know a lot about rats. I know how they behave, so I could inject little rat-like behavior into what he did, you know, and because I knew what they were like. And also because rats are pretty smart little animals, and it made sense uh, as a symbol, because rats are clever. They get in and out of places. They are uh, fairly tough, long, tough creatures that have managed to survive in most places where we do. So, in a sense, you base Silvertail on someone you knew as well. <laughs> That's true. Well, ten someones that I knew. Yeah. They don't, unfortunately, normal white rats don't live very long. Huh. So, what is the proposition that Silvertail puts to Stephen? You, Stephen Russ, will become... Gal Mystic Galaxy Defender Princess Holy Aura. To which Steve naturally responds, Are you completely blind? Yeah, since, obviously, princess doesn't seem to apply. But, of course, with magic, many things can apply that didn't make sense before. And so, indeed, he is explicitly saying that Stephen will become Princess Holy Aura, a 14- to 16-year-old girl warrior. Stephen, being something of a fan of anime himself, knows perfectly well what's, what the implications are of this. And obviously isn't quite sure that this is a path he wants to go down. <laughs> yeah, um, and what? It, let's just think about some of those implications. Um, the, the fact is that who, he's... Um, well, the important point the, the one that's impl implied on the front of the, the, the book and is, is explicitly uh, discussed later is that, in effect, you're giving up your identity. It's not just that he's turning from male to female. 
that's not really the sacrifice involved. It's that he's giving up every what he was. He's not going to be a adult man in a world that he's familiar with. He's going to be living as a not adult female in a new context. Yeah, okay, yes, he went to high school when he was a kid, but high school today is not the same as the high school that he went to. And it's even more different when you're no longer a boy, but you're a girl. Yeah, because he has to become the alter ego of Princess Holyard too, right? Holly. Yes, Holly Owen. Because he's going to have to find the other four Apocalypse Maidens who, unlike him, can't be chosen from other from adults. They have to be um, teenage girls, actually teenage girls, which introduces the next great big landmine, which is, okay, yeah, you're in the body of this teenage girl, but aren't you really a adult man, and should you be hanging around teenage girls? Usually when we see a 35-year-old man hanging around a bunch of teenage girls, so we start calling police to have discussions with him. Long discussions. Yeah. So that introduces yet another problem. Um, he also has the concern about being responsible for the lives of these kids and the fact that, okay, let's say that I find one of these girls. So you chose me because you didn't want to risk the lives of, of uh, teenage girls in a war they didn't understand. Well, so you just pushed it off onto me. Um, but also, what about their parents? Can I just drag your kid out into, into a dangerous situation and not tell you? Um, in the general magical girl genre, it's assumed that you don't tell. Um, often the magic itself makes it hard for people to notice that you're Clark Kenting, that you're, that you've got a, you know, you've got your mortal guys didn't, uh, disappeared while the magical girl appeared. Um, but the point being that usually it's kept a secret. You're, you're a classic superhero in that sense, that you've got a secret identity and nobody knows it. Hopefully. Yeah. But this is where you're, I mean, this is becoming a novel for adults and a science fiction novel or, or a fantasy. Um, and, and the question that, and what you call the series is the ethical magical girl series, right? Yes. Um, and why is that? And, and, you know, this, yes. that's kind of the theme of why we're, we're thinking about it. Silver Tail specifically chooses Stephen. And not a, a regular fourteen-year-old. Yes, Silver Tail has been doing this for thousands of years, and he has gotten more and more tired of the idea of taking kids who are on the edge of adulthood but aren't there yet, and shoving them into a war with things that really even adults don't want to face. That are monstrous to look at, monstrous to perceive. They really don't even believe in our, belong in our space and time. So. Uh, he's just weary of that, and so he decided he would try to find at least one person that would really be not only morally suited to it, but would be an adult enough to be able to understand the responsibility that was being thrust upon them and accept it fully, knowing exactly what they were giving up. Because in this cosmology, sacrifice is a tremendous power booster for any magical ritual the more that you personally are willingly giving up for the sake of the, um, for, for the sake of this action, whatever you're doing, the more powerful the magic associated with it is. Um, by choosing a man who is comfortable with being a man, who is comfortable with being an adult and has a strong self-worth, and having that man still willing to give up what they were and choose to try to be somebody else in order to save the world, is a tremendous sacrifice of their purpose and therefore empowers Princess Holy Aura far more. Um, and this ethical choice informs other choices that have to be made down the line, where Steve at one point says to Silvertail, no, we have to do this this way, because you're the one who started this off by saying you wanted to make the right choices. Well, we have to keep making the right choices all the way down the line, including including how we deal with the families of the other girls, how we deal with them, how we tell them what's going on. Yes, maybe we can't help because the means demand that the new 
uh, magical girl be found and transformed in the middle of battle. Okay, they can't avoid that. That's the way that the meme rolls, so to speak. But if they can't avoid that, they can at least be straightforward, honest, and um, and ethical afterward while trying to uh, uh, move forward and organize their little group as it grows. Yeah. And Silvertail didn't really understand that, uh, you know, when he was picking Stephen, he was... He was also choosing to have parent magic user conferences with the other Apocalypse Maidens, right? <laughs> well, yeah, that was the thing that he would sort of missed, and that was what Stephen brought him up short on. He said, if you're worried about choosing the girl and thrusting her into danger, you were the one who pointed out, what should I do as an adult if I found out somebody was doing this to my kid? And my answer was, I think I'd kill you, and you said, and you'd be right to do so. Well, yes. So... We can't just take these girls and drag them out into perilous, you know, world-shaking battles without their parents being aware of the danger they're in. No, the danger that their child is in, and they also, because as the parents of a magical girl, just like any other superhero, um, you yourself potentially can become a target. Um, in order to continue to follow the ethical path, they had to... Um, inform the parents about what was going on, because not only would it potentially be a threat to their child, and they have every right to know if their child is going to danger, but also because this is a superhero sort of situation, it could endanger their family as well, from any with the threats ranging from super-powered supernatural beings to spy agencies or law enforcement trying to uh, discover what the hell is going on because uh, this world doesn't have magic at the time until the uh, the novel begins. Yeah, and the parents. Um, I mean, we have some scenes where the parents are discussing these things and are coming up with co some contingency plans and um, just uh, considering the implications of <laughs> of yep. what their girls have gotten into. Um, and you play around the edges with. Person. With, with also with sort of this sexual aspect that you brought up before, um, and and you really, it's very clear that you don't want to bring this in um, right. to the book, I, except to deal with it um, yes. as as an issue. Right, I I wanted to recognize that it existed. Yeah, that yeah. there were sexual aspects to it, but that they were not the focus of the book. And it's really easy to to uh, you know, play with the purient aspects of uh, the, the, the magical girl thing, ranging from doing it as a one-off gag all the way to making it a major issue. And with the cross-sexual, you know, with the, with the you know, sw gender-switching bit, um, it can become even more, uh, more of a focus. And that's already been done. I mean, the sparkling generation Valkyrie Yuki is a web comic that's done some of that. And uh, there is a sex swapping one called uh, I Want to Be the Twin Tails in, uh, in Japan. But I didn't want to focus on that aspect of it. I did have to acknowledge it because it would be wrong not to. There, you know, Steve is not a monk and he's not turned into a, a, uh, a, a saint of a girl that has no sexual um, impulses either. So it has to be nodded at. But since that isn't the focus of the book, I fortunately didn't have to uh, go into any detail on that, and I saw no reason to do so, especially since I want this to be a general audience book. Yeah, I want most people to be able to read it and not creep too many of them out. I mean, there's no way that there aren't going to be some people that read this book and maybe just the concept turns them off, or other scenes in it may make them twitch and and just leave. I, I there there are too many uh, third rail topics in this for uh, for me to avoid all of it with every reader. But I did want it to be as accessible as possible, especially since, as far as I know, there is no other American novel anyway that followed this particular genre. If there is, I've never heard of it. There are, of course, some in Japan, but I've never heard of it here. 
Yeah, and I mean that's it. That's that's the hard thing, and you pulled it off. I think you really pulled it off in spades with this as well. Um, this is that. I think you wrote the book that you were intending, um, and it's and it's really fun. So Stephen, uh, Steve must become Holly uh, Owen, and um, what is what is her character become? How? How is she shaped by the fact that she's sort of a transformed uh, older dude? Well, it's more a matter of how is Steve transformed by the fact that he becomes she. Yeah. And because Steve is at first, at first, it's just a matter of I'm wearing a different body, but I'm Steve. And then slowly that starts to change. And there are many reasons for that. Part of it is, is physically, the, the physical change comes with different hormonal systems, different physical sensations, different perceptions. I mean, when you were six foot three and 300 pounds, it doesn't feel anything like being a five foot six um, young girl at all. Um, none of that is the same. And so that starts to influence the way you think, the way you feel. Even things like color perception, it turns out that women in general tend to have much uh, sharper and uh, diverse color perception. It's not just a, a stereotype. They actually see, many of them anyway, actually see more. Some people who have, who have uh, done the uh, male to female transition uh, and you know, go in the whole way and use the, the hormonal things and so on have turned out to increase their own perception that way. So... Part of the part of the change comes from the fact that he's just in a different body. Part of it also comes from the fact that, unfortunately, um, Silvertail didn't think of until it was too late that behind and within the enchantment that transformed someone to Holy Aura uh, are fragments of the spirits of all the previous Holy Auras. So you you are touched by and influenced by all these other spirits, not exactly as memories, they don't talk to you in general or anything, but their feelings and perceptions and so on, and all of them were teenage girls. So there's, there's this, this, you know, this, this uh, force behind that influences um, Steve and Steve to Holly. And finally, it's living in this different life and realizing that when he was younger, he just didn't he didn't appreciate things that he saw when he was younger that he sees better now. And he actually comes to like being Holly. She be, she, Holly starts to become Holly and not Steve really working hard on playing a girl named Holly to the point that eventually Holly really feels a division between Holly and Steve. The memories of Steve are still there. The personality of Steve is still there somewhere and sometimes will pop up, especially when young people are threatened because it's where his strong feeling responsibility is. But she is actually a person in, unto her own right. And this causes her and others around her some considerable trouble. Uh, at least in terms of emotional dealing with things, because it's really hard when you realize that your own self-perception has changed and that you don't think of yourself as the same person that you were. In, in this case, it was only months ago, but they're very intense months, so it feels a lot longer than that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Steve gets what Steve gets out of it is that he, even though he transforms into somebody else, uh, he he does get to relive his his life, um, his his youth, um, and and have a very also, consequential youth. That's true. He also and the consequential part is really important. He gets he is offered the chance to do what many people fantasize about to do something that really makes a difference that will make a tremendous difference to the world even though at least the way that it is supposed to work out, in the end, he won't remember it. The basic rules are that if you succeed, if you defeat um, Azathoth of the Nine Arms and her forces and bottle them back up, 
shoving the magic back into the bottle will basically reset the world back to just before you first were selected as Holy Aura. And you'll go about your life, and the reward that you get for that is your life will be better. You'll be lucky. Things will improve. And how, what does Holly get um, from having been Steve? Um, it, she has a certain wisdom, she gets right? A she gets a tremendous amount of, of life knowledge. Um, there's one sequence in which uh, she's injured and in a lot of pain, and one of the things she says is, well, Steve got, has gotten hurt many times, and I understand this level of pain, and I know how to power through it. I know how to force myself to keep going. Um, she has, has a perception of how adults behave that no teenager is going to have. She has a store of knowledge that a 14-year-old won't have gotten because they just didn't have the time. To an extent, this just happen, happens to help uh, Holly in school. All right, the courses have changed, but hey, I did go through high school before. I do know my reading, writing, arithmetic, and all the other stuff. So uh, I can keep doing my superheroing without falling behind in my studies. Yeah, she has to go to school. <laughs> so, she does? Yeah. So, How are uh, you going to meet other teenage girls during the school year if you don't go to school? Yeah, and you got to keep your grades up. Yeah can't get in trouble that way. Yeah. You've got plenty of other things to get in trouble with. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the book is, is, um, it's this, it's great action adventure. There's some cool fights and some great monsters. It's also this sort of at the same time, this thoughtful reflection on what this crazy genre implies for character. What if, what if this were really real? Um, you know, you're asking you as the author are asking if if this sort of thing is really true in a in a real setting. Um, how would how would the um, how would would you know fully rounded, not stereotypical characters respond to it? Um, how did you tell me a little bit about the process of writing this, if you will? Tell us um, how did you uh, sort of well, <laughs> weave those two realities together? First of well, first of all drinking man, I probably would have taken big drinks before I ever started this. Um, as you said, I was very enthusiastic about the, the concept when I wrote it up, but a part of me was saying, but I, I can be safely enthusiastic about this because they'll never choose it, so I won't need to worry about dealing with all this shit. <laughs> and then you proved me wrong. <laughs> so the process was first to figure out the logic of the world. I can't really write anything unless I have a general idea of how things work because the um, all the actions after that of the villains and the heroes have to fit with the way things work in the world. So I had to figure out how did magic work, at least in the broad strokes. Why wasn't it here? Um, what the bad guys wanted out of it, how their powers worked, and how the uh, uh, Apocalypse Maiden's powers worked and why. Once I had that down, some of the next sets of events were fairly clear. Um, I had to finish designing Steve and Silvertail and get their dynamic going. And once, once I got, I think, to the point where Steve had had, um, where Holy Or had had her first battle, and Steve had recovered from that and gotten some grip on what happened, I had a good enough idea of them that I started to see where the rest of the book had to go. And I knew the general outline as I'd send it to you. And for the most part, it ended up following that outline, although if you reread the outline, um, you can see some areas where it, it definitely changed. So that simply was when I got to the character that was supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z, I realized, no, the character isn't going to do that. Like I'd originally envisioned uh, Cordy, um, Cordelia, as being much more of the, and deliberately so, the, the stereotypical um, upper-class cheerleader, you know, snooty type who has to adjust to dealing with these other people that she normally wouldn't have in her circle. But by the time I got up to that point, I said, you know, I don't like that. I think she should be somebody who's more caught up in this by circumstances out of her control, but 
not anything having to do with her not being a decent person, although she might worry that she would become one at some point. She does, in fact, say something to that effect later in the book. Um, in terms of writing it for the genre, well, first I, re, I reacquainted myself with a lot of the classics of the genre and also some of the deconstructions, especially uh, uh, Madoka Magica. In fact, I wrote parts of this two music from Madoka Magica because it just seemed to fit so well. Um, and I looked at the points where I stopped and said, but what about? Because those are the points in which I felt that it wasn't looking at the world. I mean, this happens to me a lot when I'm reading books. It happened to me when I was reading uh, Anne Rice's stuff. It happened to me when, I was, when I'd been reading, you know, watching movies, whatever. Um, and it was those parts that I said, this is where I have to really address something. Um, the most obvious of those being, why are we using frickin' teenage girls to fight monsters, you know, beyond human conception? Hey, why? Why are we not choosing Rambo? You know, why are we not getting, getting the most badass people that we can find and having them and giving them super magic powers and letting them fight? So that was partly a necessity. I had to figure out, why do you have to do that? And it turned out that's because magic is based on symbolism. And they stand between adult and child. They stand between the dark and the light, between innocence and loss of innocence and everything. And because of that, they are the only thing that can stand between the world and the forces that will destroy it. Um, of many of the other things that happen in the uh, explanations for events um, stem from this idea of symbolism. Everything in magical, in, in, in Princess Holy Aura, um, of any significance has some symbolic root to it. Um, and um, I did a lot of work in both incorporating what I wanted to do with the symbolism and also in adding in little nods to various manga and other things that people would catch if they looked at it very carefully. Yeah. Those that, um, the, you know, walking through a minefield, <laughs> those that love the genre are going to find a lot of stuff, but, um, those that, um, are new to it are, you know, you can just read the thing and, uh, and get a lot out of it. And, and, uh, it's not going to be an impediment if you're not a if you're not a big fan. I think um, it explains or if you're ignorant of it. Necessities of the of the book. Yeah, the book explains itself fairly well. I think it does. I think I'd well. originally written an explanation of the magical girl thing, but we never put it in. Yeah, I you know I just I, I think we probably didn't need it. I I completely agree. Posted yeah. it anyway. It really um it really comes across in the book. Um, so what are you working on at the moment? Well, um, for Bane, I'm, I'm finally back on track after many personal disasters in the last year with um, writing Castaway Peril, the third of the Castaway books. Oh, cool. Um, I've, I've just hit a really exciting point in it, so I can move forward um, and hopefully get that done in the next few months. Um, I've just completed a... Uh, I'm just completing right now like the last three chapters of my Demons of the Past trilogy, which I'm going to be publishing through Double Dragon. And uh, my wife and I are working on a uh, urban fantasy series called Fall of Veils. And uh, Double Dragon will publish the first of those called French Roast Apocalypse. Uh, for Bane, I also have another projected one that me and Eric have to sit down and really finish hashing out. We're just calling it Fenrir as a working title, and it's a... Uh, it's another hard science fiction uh, epic, but set in a completely different universe than Boundary. Huh. I haven't heard about that. That sounds really cool. So, uh, oh, oh, it is. Uh, it, the, uh, the, it's, it's an idea where people have tried something sort of like it, but I don't think anything quite like what me and Eric were talking about. So i got to get back together with him and really hash out the details so that when I write, I can just charge forward. Yeah, well, I, I love this uh, Castaway um, Castaway series uh, sub series within the Boundary series. It's really um, it's really fun. Um, it's been a lot of fun to write. I, I I have come to really love these characters, and I'll be kind of sad when it's done because um, I really love Sakura and some of the other characters in it. Um, 
probably Sakura the most and, and whips, but uh, I have a fondness for the sergeant too and for um, Sakura's mom, Mora. And I like all of them, but uh, I will really miss not writing with these kids. Yeah. It's, uh, it's for those not familiar with it, go read it. It's sort of, you can't call it Swiss Family Robinson in space, but it's it's sort of that in a way. I can call it that. It's it's what's called a Robinson aid. It's really derived from Swiss Family Robinson and of course Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. So the uh, the book that I was most influenced by myself wasn't so much Swiss Family Robinson, um, so much as Jules Verne's Mysterious Island, where uh, unlike Swiss Family Robinson, where they ended up like with a whole ship of stuff. Um, they end up with just whatever's in their pockets. Yeah. I guess it's a, yeah, it's a genre. Uh, and this is the science fiction. Mm -hmm. This is the science fiction version of, uh, of that genre or entry in that genre. So, um, well, the book out at the moment, and we'll definitely talk to you about, uh, you and Eric about that when it comes out, uh, the book out at the moment, um, in booksellers everywhere is Princess Holy Aura by Reiki Spore. Um, it's available at booksellers everywhere. Right. Um, thank you once again for coming on the podcast and talking to us about this great, great, uh, oh, it's a weird, strange, wonderful novel you've written. <laughs> thank you. It's been a great pleasure, uh, as always. And uh, when we get to Castaway, we'll do another one, I'm sure. <laughs> This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leiden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior, and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yoskalen and Corville's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mounted armed attacks on others of Corville's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age, and perhaps her very life, is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. Truly, Pilot has. I have been fortunate beyond the mundane workings of luck to have encountered Master Barrick Jones himself, to have been privileged to assist in the transfer of one of the precious few of the newly waked would have been good fortune aplenty. I tell you, I am counted one whom fortune favors, and on that meeting alone I would have been satisfied to have met yourself, shining in the armor of your loyalty, and pilot Tokel also. I must wonder what amazements will next come to me. She laughed and waggled her fingers in a nonsense sign. It is well that I am not Leaden, is it not? Else I would expect doom indeed, in balance for the riches I have received. Hasenthal had mixed feelings regarding luck, but there was another topic on which she was eager for information. 
Has the Admiral survived the transfer? Inky's face grew serious. Well, there, that is what we will learn in due time. I believe that he has, but I acknowledge myself as an optimist. Master Barrick Jones believes that the Admiral survives until we run the wake-up. She shook her head, which shows him once again to be wiser than I. Hope tempered with caution, that is the best course, and saves needless stress on the emotional apparatus. Hazenthal did not say that Tolly's hope was every bit as terrible as his fear. If Inky had not seen this, then it was surely a secret she was not at liberty to reveal. So, no trouble on the way, but now that they were arrived, it seemed that there might be trouble indeed. For Stu did not, to Hazenthal's eye, look as pleased to receive Inky's announcement as she had been to make it. All that's left, is it? He said, voice sullen. He pulled off his cap, wiped his hand over his shiny head, and resettled the cap. Inky considered him. I did not mean to make light, sir. Of course, the remaining procedures are arduous, and we are not yet assured of a happy outcome. The pilot and I were speaking of that on our way to you. Still, we are arrived at the point where the ship is necessary to progress, and so we have come to receive it. Stu shook his head. I tried calling the Admiral when I come on shift, he said. No answer. That is correct, Inky said. Mentor Barrick Jones has successfully extracted Admiral Bunter from the ship's keeping station there. She waved a casual hand, perhaps meaning to indicate the Admiral's location. We have, as a favor to you, scrubbed those comps that remain functional. We did, I fear, lose at least one, and possibly two, in the transfer process. Stu was frowning. So the Admiral ain't in them ships anymore, he said. That is correct. Where is he, then? Inky tipped her head. Why, he is sleeping, Master Stu, resting from his labors. Here's what, then. You just let him keep on sleeping and get him out of here, why not? Station don't want him. You heard that, didn't you? I did. However, we had an agreement. You were to provide us with a ship capable of housing the Admiral so that he might continue his life in comfort. Well, that's it, see? Admin don't think he ought to continue his life. Got one sitting pretty close to the station master who's thinking it best to call in the bounty hunters. Been working that theme for a while, since before the tinker got herself blown out of space. Just about home with that is my reading. Got the master thinking Jemmy Atha's here'll get a cut of the bounty for handing him in all nice and docile. He shook his head, holding his hands up. Best thing, best thing, pilot is to take Admiral Bunter out of here, asleep, like you say he is, and find him another ship someplace else. That is not acceptable. Inky's voice had lost every nuance but edge. We require a ship, Master Stu. I chose one, and you agreed to allow me to have it for the good of the Admiral. Well, it's what I'm telling you, ain't it? Admin says we ain't giving away ships, not even one of the junkers out there where the Admiral used to hang his hat, if he had one. For sure and certain, we ain't giving away a good, modern ship with the repairs mostly done. Somebody'll want to buy that ship, and we ain't exactly rich in this part of space. There was a short, charged silence. Hazenthal shifted, scuffing her boot on the floor. Stu looked up to her, and she smiled, showing teeth. He pressed his lips together and looked away, more irritated, she thought, than afraid. Stu was not timid then. That was interesting. Very well, Inky said sharply. I hear that the ship I have chosen must be purchased. Is that correct, Master Vanagoff? 
Bottom line, and two degrees off center, but yeah, that's it. Very well. I shall purchase this ship. Stu blinked. I don't think... There is nothing here for you to think about, Master Vanagoff. I wish to purchase a ship. As I have previously inspected it and found it adequate to my needs, you may proceed with generating a bill of sale. Ship like that, Stu said. We got repairs in it, pilot, and tech hours. Inky shifted. Stu froze in place, and for an instant, Hasenthal saw herself as the natural protector of the technician. Before she could place herself between Inky and the counter, there came a reflective flash and the ring of a coin hitting a hard surface. Please do not trouble yourself to dicker, Inky said, and angled her chin toward the coin still twirling on the counter. A bill of sale, please. The pilot and I wish to board my vessel at once. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a self-sustaining explosion of joyous holiday cheer captured in a bottle for consumption throughout next year when spirits are lagging or just any time to spice up a cup of Sumatra. Plus, thanks and praise for Reich E. Spore, author of Princess Holiara. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and keep reaching for the stars.